We're, we seem to be having trouble with the bookstore getting the Morris book in. Um, so how many of you need that book? Let's, let's do an actual count. I can't. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. How many of you um, actually purchased it from the bookstore? Anybody? You did. It's there. Yeah, they were like, we, were there a weird section where like not, there was for some reason over on the, by the main thing, not CLA, but they're, they're labeled as CLA. So there were like three copies of the other. Did you get it from the same No, I had it um, from the same company. All right, well, we're going to check today and um, try to get that. For some reason, I'm having trouble here with PowerPoint. While this is deciding, there, there we go, there we go. Um, I was about to say, while we were deciding, while this was deciding whether to open or not, um, that I would try to explain something that, in listening to my last lecture, I think I glossed over and did not explain very well. Um, and there's sort of two parts to it. The first is that, um, as I mentioned, quoting the Chias on the shores of Syracuse, in the Greek mind, the people are prior to the city. The people comes first. We see that in Aristotle. In the Roman mind, the city comes before the people. You could not be Roman unless there was a city called Rome that could be inhabited. Now, that is significant. And it is also significant that Rome begins with, it begins as a political association. It doesn't actually evolve into that, where they themselves marked their beginnings from a specific point in time when this concord was reached between Latin and Sabine, according to the myth. Um, that it was, from the beginning, a political association that um, was an amalgamation of a variety of different cultures, perhaps combined with the fact that their gods were not already present in a place but had to be conjured up by a ritual meant that they could move around and wherever they went, they could conjure up those gods and if everything was okay, they could then sort of say the sooth and lay out the diagrams and do on, plow the pomerium, found the city, and at that point, once you inhabited it, you became Roman, regardless of where you came from before that. Um, that perhaps accords them a certain advantage in terms of the long-term uh, success in sort of foreign territories. So today, after we go through the buildup of the Roman Forum, um, we will then move to colonial cities. We may not get through all of that today, but we will, as I said, consider this part two of a four-part uh, module. Now, the material record is interesting because the, oh, great. Okay, well, let's try that. Um, the material record confirms to some degree the myth um, of, this, of this Sinoicism, this joining together. Because in the forum itself, in the forum necropolis, which, like in Athens, was covered over at some point and reoccupied, uh, in the same grave shaft were found cremation graves and inhumation graves. And if you recall, the Sabines practiced inhumation, the Latins practiced cremation, and so what you've got is a husband and wife, or a wife and a husband, a family unit, in other words, being buried in the same grave shaft 
one of which was cremated, one of which was uh, is through inhumation. So there is a kernel of truth in the myth. And um, this actually is, I think, significant because if you could ritualize that in some way, it meant that then you could, uh, the gods being portable in a sense, um, you could then carry that wherever you were and you could sort of conjure it up. And then if you did the ceremonies right and performed the rituals right, plowed the pomerium, this is what we're going to be talking about, put in the cardo and the decumanus and the mundus and the capitolium and so forth, all the major sort of public constitutional elements, it didn't matter where you were, it was still Rome. It was a little Rome. And thus the planting of um, locks of hair, first fruits, dirt from where you were born uh, that you would put into this hole and then seal it up was in a sense symbolically planting a piece of Rome into the ground somewhere else, right? Um, so um, all of their cities uh, were done this way, those thousands of cities that they built. Well, let's go back then to um, the ancient city, the, the beginnings of Rome. Uh, the two significant hills here being the Palatine and the Capitoline. Uh, Capitol, by the way, is where our word in English, Capitol, comes from, comes from the building. So the state Capitol is spelled with an O, and Atlanta is the Capital spelled with an A. Uh, Capital means head, cap, decapitate, and had to do uh, capital also money. It had to do with the number of head of cattle you had, right? Um, so there's this distinction. Capitol actually takes its name from uh, this hill, Capitol. Um, and then in between was this sort of flat, swampy area with a small stream flowing through called the Velabrum. The dots that we see right here is that Forum Necropolis. And just on the edge of that Forum Necropolis, two buildings would emerge in the middle of the 8th century of BCE. Uh, one was the Regia, the house of the king, uh, and the second was um, the, the, the temple of Vesta. Uh, it is in these graves that we see here that, in fact, those inhumation and cremation burials were found in the same grave shaft in 1902 by Giacomo Boni. The Capitoline Hill here would develop as the arcs or the citadel, similar to the sort of, a, not the same, but similar to the Acropolis, um, with the giant temple of Jupiter Capitolinus, the largest temple, very ungainly building, aesthetically not so pleasing in certain respects, but uh, double the size of the Parthenon, huge. And then the asylum, the area in between. Uh, the view from there looks like this, and I want to mention one thing. The site of the accord here would be plowed out as the comitium, and there is the mundus, which is actually attached to it, here on the banks of the um, Velabrum. And that's what it looks like today. Um, the forum was ultimately filled in. We'll see some examples of that in a moment. The site of the comitium was here. This view is taken from the Capitoline Hill looking uh, into, into the Forum. Um, the Mundus is actually this structure that we see right here. And then later, Septimius Severus in 202, uh, actually his sons in uh, 202 um, of the Common Era actually built this some 900 years later and sort of destroyed it all. Um, there we see the Temple of Vesta, and we're going to concentrate now on this area that we see here. This is the Palatine Hill that we see up here. So in the myth, in the story, uh, we would have had Latins on the Palatine, and the Sabine, Titus Tadius, would have had this view, and everything that we see down in here um, would have been a swamp about uh, 16 feet lower than it is right now. And uh, this is the Augustan uh, period, first century uh, B.C. A.D., right on the cusp of, of that um, level of the, of the forum, the historical level of the forum with a stream flowing through it, right? So these two buildings that we see here at number 45 and number 46, number 45 is the Regia, or the House of the King, and number 46 is the Temple of Vesta. Uh, Vesta was a very old pre-Roman 
cult that um, had to do with the sort of symbolic uh, familial hearth. Uh, she was the goddess of domestic affairs, and uh, the priestesses of the cult of Vesta were to keep the fire burning. That was their primary um, primary goal. But it was attached to and part of what is now believed to be a much larger sort of imperial, not imperial, but royal um, complex that we see here. Now, you'll also notice that all of the orientation of these buildings is pretty much in this direction, with the exception of this that we see right here, because that was the original orientation of the forum that we will see in just a moment. There is uh, showing true north and uh, true south, east and west. The circle or oval that you see in the upper right quadrant is the Forum Necropolis. And then the black circle that we see here at the intersection is the House of the Vestals. And apparently this was part of this much larger complex, all of which was oriented, as you'll see in the regia, of the remains of this building that we see here, all of it was oriented in this particular direction. Now, I'm the reason this is important will become apparent as we go through the colonial town founding ritual. The only place, one of the only places, there are only two or three places where this registers, the original orientation registers, is here in the atrium of the House of the Vestals. That's the Temple of Vesta. That's the remnants of the Regia. Right here we see this pavement. And if we actually zoom in on that, I put a compass here and snap this showing that the joints of the flooring <coughs> is actually directly uh, north-south. Um, the Vestals, of course, smoked a lot of cigarettes, and so uh, we have the remnants of that there as well. That's a joke. Okay. Um, there we see then at this end of the forum, the Regia and the Temple of Vesta, uh, as they emerged in the historical period. Now, at the other end was the Capitoline that I've already mentioned with the big Temple of Jupiter Capitolinus and the Citadel, which contained the Temple of Juno Moneta. And then we see these sort of public assembly places here, the Comitium, the sacred hole in the ground called the Mundus, which actually had a stone on top of it called the Umbilicus, symbolically connecting it to the heavens, the underworld to the heavens. <coughs> Excuse me. And then this... Um, very ancient temple here, which was the A.D.'s or altar of Saturn. Saturn had originally been on the Capitoline, but he kind of got kicked off and moved down the slope. It's sort of a side story, but anyway. The Etruscan uh, influence is evident in the Temple of Jupiter Capitolinus, which began with the last of the seven kings, Tarquinius Superbus, in 510 B.C., he would only have a year to work on it before the Republic was formed. He was thrown out, and the Republic was formed, and they continued to work on it and completed it, um, which was then subsequently rebuilt several times throughout the Roman Imperial Age. Again, uh, the Roman temple is distinct from the Greek temple in that it is not peripteral, meaning the columns do not go all the way around it. It has this very pronounced proneos, or front porch, very frontal, sitting up on a high podium here with a three-part cella with uh, Jupiter in the center and Minerva on his right and Juno on his left. There is a scale drawing, just to give you a sense of the size of this thing, uh, a scale drawing of the Temple of Jupiter Capitolinus uh, on the left and on the right um, the Parthenon on the Acropolis in Athens. And you see the how much larger um, and also how much uglier this, um, this building actually was. So we began to get then after the conjoining of, of um, during the Regal period and on into the early Republic, uh, we get a sort of embryonic public space emerging down here at A. This will be uh, the forum. The, the, the signal act was the encapsulation, as we'll see, of this velabrum stream into a sewer called the cloaca, means drain, Maxima, the great drain. This was an enormous public health move because it got all the E. coli bacteria away. It also meant that they could actually um, pump gravel into the, into the forum, drain the swamp, and raise the level of it so 
so that it could be used as political space. It's a huge engineering feat. This occurs in the middle of the 6th century um, BCE. The water supply, excuse me, the water, so here we see the Forum Necropolis totally abandoned by, um, the, by this time. Uh, the Regia, number four, which remained in the Republic even though they no longer had kings. Uh, they, they instead created an office called the Rex Sacorum, the king of sacred things. Um, some very famous people became that. In fact, uh, they held the office of Pontifex Maximus. Um, the um, Pontifex was the keeper of the bridges. Pont, keeper of the bridge. Remember the salt trade, controlling the salt trade and the wooden bridge across the river. So embedded in their religion was the notion, in fact, that this is sort of part of this collective thing. You're the curator of, of the bridge. Later in the Christian period, popes will assume that title. Uh, the water supply for the embryonic city was this spring that flowed here at the base of the Palatine Hill called the Fons Juturni, where it then flowed into this little winding stream. And then here, the original site of the Comitium with a sacred spot called the Lapis Niger, a black stone. Number three is the Mundus. And the gray building is the site of the original Curia. What is the Curia? It is the equivalent of the Bulletarian in the Greek city. It was uh, where the Senate met. Originally, they met outdoors. Um, and the Senate is actually an interesting thing because the Senate, uh, it actually comes from uh, a Latin word, senaculum, which is uh, embedded in our English word, senile. Um, it meant old man. And uh, these were the, this was the tribal council that acted as a kind of uh, advisory body to the king and elected the king. They elected the king. Later in the Republican period, they would elect the consul who actually um, uh, presided over the Senate. But the Senate could pass no laws. The Senate issued decrees. And then uh, once this gray building is built, uh, the popular assembly moved one of, there were four, but one of them moved into the comitium and then all of this would play out in public on the steps of the Curia where the Senate would meet and debate an issue. They would issue what was called a Senatus Consultum, the advice of the Senate. And then the tribune of the plebs right, came down off the steps into the Comitium. All this acted out in public and gave it to um, his colleagues in the Comitium where it was introduced into legislation and it was voted on, and it was voted on in blocks based upon your income, based upon your income, believe it or not. Um, it's complex and arcane reasons for that. It had to do with, in time of war, you were responsible for paying for your own equipment. <laughs> so if we superimpose that on the top of the archaeological map of the Forum, we see that the orientation of the Forum was originally quite different in this strict north-south alignment. Adjacent to the Curia, uh, another building was built in the um, Republic, early Republic, which is called the Basilica Portia. And then to the left of that, the Carcere, the Mamertine prison. This is actually the prison. Uh, incarcerate comes from that term. And we notice this Greek word, Basilica, which originally meant the king, uh, the house of the king Archon, uh, but in Rome, it became the law court. So what we have here, then, is the legislative branch, a bicameral legislature, a Senate and a House, in effect. Um, the uh, judicial branch in, in the Basilica, and then it all sort of begins to make sense. Later, this would all move, and you see superimposed on this the outline of later buildings that would come in, including the moving of, 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 of the Curia here, and the eventual displacement of the Comitium that we see here. This is the Lapis Niger uh, that we see there with the rostrum, the speaker's platform, facing out onto the forum somewhere about uh, right there. Okay, that curve that we see right there was the site of the original rostrum that faced out into the space of public assembly that we see here. That is the Lapis Niger. In 1902, it was excavated, and uh, they thought according to tradition, that it was supposed to be 
like the heroin in uh, Paestum, they thought they were at the tomb of the founder. So the, everybody's all excited. We found the tomb of Romulus. Well, Romulus wasn't in there. Nobody was in there. Um, instead, this stone was in there. And the stone is the oldest Latin inscription known, which is fairly significant since all the text in here is written using the Latin alphabet. Um, that was actually a taboo, saying that no one could defile that spot. This is a sacred spot. And just to the right of that, over here behind this stone, was in fact the Mundus. The original water supply, as I mentioned, was the, uh, a spring. This was later uh, captured in this small little temple front called an edicula, and it opened out into a small basin that we see here. Uh, it, it ceased to function as the primary water supply of the city a long, long time ago, but it retained symbolic importance throughout the entire uh, Roman uh, period. There we see um, Juturna. This is actually an altar, and uh, this spilled out here down into a basin um, that we see down here. So there is the Lacus Juturnae and the Fons Juturnae. So this begins to make sense. Over here we have the... the, the Former, um, former house of the king, now the house of the high priest and the functionaries of, 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 of government, the college of priests. Here we have the temple of Vesta. Here the uh, space of political assembly, the mundus. Um, here is the legislative branch, these two. And here is the basilica, the judicial branch. And here this ancient temple of Saturn. Now, it's supposed to be advancing. Ah, there we go. In 550, roughly at the same time that the Forum Stile, that chupus, that stone that was found under the Lapis Niger, um, the, the Labrum stream was, as I mentioned, encapsulated in stone and buried as a sewer called the Cloaca Maxima. There you see it sort of as it tracks through its course. The sewer built in 550 B.C. was taken out of service in 1936. That is at least one definition of sustainable. Now, the question then would be, did they treat their sewage? No. So as the Tiber became more and more polluted, they had to bring fresh water in by piping it in via aqueduct uh, over incredibly long distances. I'm just showing here that later the curia is moved, and there is the where it was moved to, the Ancient Curia Stilia is underneath this church. Uh, underneath this building is actually the entrance to the Carcere. Uh, so this is what it began to look like then as time in the, in the historical period, in the imperial age. Uh, again, just to locate you, the Cloaca Maxima, crossing through the Forum, exits uh, at the foot of the Palatine, between the Palatine and Capitoline, and comes out underneath this arch, which is called the Arch of Janus. Janus was the god of those um, entry points that were not a violation of the pomerium, the boundary. He had two heads, front and back. January is his month. He was father time, right? The old man and the boy. He's looking in two directions. And um, as I said, January was his month. Janus, no equivalent in the Greek world. Entirely Roman. The sewer passed uh, through here. Uh, just to the right of this photograph and emptied out into the Tiber. Um, and there we see it. Uh, that's actually the Cloaca Maxima, constructed in 550 B.C., rebuilt several times. And then the modern stone facing that we see here was done in the 1930s when the caves were built along the sides of the rivers. I also find it interesting that this homeless guy here who has a little camp up there, probably doesn't realize that he's actually sleeping on top of a 550-year-old sewer. There is still some, some effluent flowing through it. It stinks, uh, but it's possible to actually walk through it. So as time went on, um, they sort of outgrew the uh, orientation, the original orientation, and so they had to re-inaugurate the city, which we'll get into later, and crank it around 42 degrees within the same quadrant. New uh, judicial buildings called Basilica were built here and here, and later those would become the two major um, law courts in the, in the Forum. Every Roman city had a basilica. 
Um, later, they, that building type would be appropriated for congregational worship in the Christian period, and thus the name is often transferred to the name of a Christian church. Even though it is a building type, um, it doesn't describe its function. It describes its type. It was the law court in the Roman world. Well, where does this come from? Um, I have a theory. I'm going to show it to you real quickly. This is the Stoa of Attalus. I think what they did is they took the Stoa, the Greek Stoa, they cut it in half. They then um, reversed it and joined it together, and what you got was side aisles, a nave, um, and then shops at least on one side, or later side chapels that opened to the interior. When this functioned as a law court, typically it would have an edicula at this end, actually at both ends, and the entrance was on the side, and uh, it is there that the, um, like this, this apse that we see is where the uh, judiciary, where the magistrates would sit when court was in session, and lawyers would confer uh, with their clients here in these side aisles. The basilica form, of course, was um, to get light through these clear story windows that we see here down into the nave. It's a very old church, uh, Santa Sabina. Some of you in the room have been in it. Some of you are very familiar with it. And um, that's about as close as we can get to a first century A.D. Roman law court. That's what the building would have looked like. Okay? And there it is, the Basilica Fulvia Emilia, built in 179 uh, B.C.E. Uh, the brick building that we see in the background here is the Curia. Curia Julia, it was begun by Julius Caesar, completed by Augustus. There we see looking down the nave. And there we see it as number five with um, money changers and shops at number two and three, opening out stoa-like onto the Sacra Via. And then a second basilica is constructed at number 35 on the map, which is called the Basilica Julia. Again, the Curia is changed and moved, and I've got to go back and get rid of that because it's inappropriately placed. This is uh, the Basilica Julia. It was a very large building that we see uh, looking down toward um, this, the Palatine Hill that we see here, and then here we have um, the Temple of Vesta. This is the Temple of Castor and Pollux, which those three columns stood through all of time, um, and it's irrelevant really to this discussion. This is um, the 42-degree uh, rotation within the same quadrant that I mentioned, so that by the late republic, this is more or less what the forum looks like. Now, this set a pattern um, that would be repeated in a certain way over a long period of time uh, outside of Rome in all of their colonies when they would inaugurate a town. Again, all of their colonies, all of their colonial enterprises were... Uh, inaugurated prior to occupation. That is what made them Roman. Well, Rome in the mid-Republic was a very small um, operation in central Italy. Uh, it would come to uh, control an area larger than the United States today, and um, and implant Roman institutions everywhere in North Africa, the Middle East, uh, Europe, and so on. But uh, the turning point came uh, at the close of the third century, around 200 BCE, with the uh, two wars with Carthage, beginning uh, one around 240 BC, and the other one finally concluded in 202. Who, what was Carthage? Carthage was a Phoenician. Uh, settlement, a city that uh, was built in what is now Tunisia, uh, very close to Rome. And they controlled, the Carthaginians controlled the entire uh, western end of the Mediterranean. Who controlled the eastern end of the Mediterranean? Well, it was the remnants of the Alexandrian Empire. So the Seleucids controlled what is now Lebanon, Syria, part of Turkey, all of Iraq, down into Israel. And the Ptolemies uh, controlled Egypt and then up into Judea, part of southern, the southern part of, um, of what is now Israel, um, as well as um, a series of, um, 
of alliances that they had with, with these, these leagues of cities called the Achaean League, these Greek cities that were joined together um, in leagues. Um, war broke out in the first, um, in the first Punic War when uh, they were fighting over um, some rather silly things, actually, fighting over um, a group of people down in Sicily. Um, Carthage was the major naval power in the Mediterranean at the time. Rome did not have a navy. They did not have a single ship. Uh, by the end of this, the first Carthaginian War, uh, Rome had defeated the Carthaginian navy. And this was not possible. I remember a number of years ago when Puerto Rico beat the United States in basketball. And everybody was saying, yeah, how could that happen? I mean, you know, Puerto Rico, yeah, they're really nice people down there. But, you know, it's a little bitty island and sort of like the 51st state, but not really the 51st state. And some of them want to be in blah, blah, blah. But the United States, we invented basketball. You know, this great big country with 350 million people. We got beat by Puerto Rico. Well, that was sort of the Carthaginian mindset, right? How could this group of people who didn't even have a ship, in fact, who learned, um, built their navy by capturing a Carthaginian ship and putting it on the beach and teaching the people to row while the thing was on the sand, all right? Uh, the slow one now will later be fast, right? And um, they in could never learn how to actually fight naval battles. In fact, in this at this time, the, uh, the way you fought a naval battle was to pull orthogonal to your enemy ship, and then you had ramming beaks on the front of your ship, and you would try to ram the ship in the side and sink it. Well, the Romans never could quite figure out how to do that, so they invented, pretty clever, they invented this thing, uh, which was actually a large mast with a big spike on the end of it and a board like a gangplank, and they would pull up alongside the enemy ship and lower this thing, and it would sink down into the deck of the enemy ship, and they would all run across and fight with swords like they were fighting on land. Uh, well, this so kind of baffled everybody else that the Romans ultimately became successful at this. It's a practice that they actually never totally abandoned. Well, um, the person who was defeated by um, Rome in the first Carthaginian War was the father of a very famous uh, general that you've heard of, Hannibal. And um, according to Livy, Hannibal's father uh, took him, took Hannibal, to the Temple of Apollo in Carthage when he was eight years old and made him swear an oath that he would dedicate his life to the destruction of Rome. Um, Hannibal broke a treaty, brought elephants and troops, formed a treaty with the Celts in what's now northern Spain, southern France, brought them over the Alps, down into Italy, where he defeated in one battle at Cannae the entire Roman army in one day, 55,000 troops. To put that in context for my generation that fought in Vietnam, 58,000 Americans died in Vietnam over about a 15-year period. In one day, Rome lost its entire army. Now, Hannibal is at the Colleen Gate on the Quirinal Hill, and all he had to do was walk in. But he could not believe that anybody who could defeat his father didn't have another 55,000-man army somewhere behind that gate. And he thought it was a trap. And he thought about it for three days, and then he made a fatal error. He retreated. And he moved down into uh, central Italy, where he fought for, get this, he was in Italy for 11 years. The Second Punic War lasted 14 years. It was really the first world war. Everybody got caught up into it. The Numidians ended up switching sides. Um, Rome was, uh, didn't even have an army, and they brought an old man, almost 60 years old, out of retirement, uh, Quintius Fabius Stator, the delayer, and he invented guerrilla warfare. And he would move around at night in central Italy, and he would attack Carthaginian allies and attack their camps, and then he would withdraw back into the forest, and uh, trying to disrupt their supply lines until Rome could form alliances with others. And ultimately, um, as I said, this thing lasted for 14 years. Now, the outcome of this war was significant, because at the beginning of it, it looked like this. 
Kian League, Seleucid, Ptolemaic, Minor Kingdoms in Turkey, Carthage, um, and then the red is controlled by Rome. The yellow and orange is controlled by uh, Carthage or allied to Carthage. There's the 14-year battle. There's the movement down. At the end of it, Rome controlled this much of the Mediterranean. And within 50 years, they would control the entire thing, with the exception of Egypt. Um, well, this was uh, had a huge impact, uh, huge, not only on the geopolitical territory of uh, places in Africa and Mauritania, Libya, and so forth, uh, but actually in Rome itself, because suddenly in the chaos of this 14-year world war, um, all of the farms had been abandoned because back until this, you have only fought in the summer. You planted the crops, and then you went off and fought, and then you came back and you harvested the crops, and then you waited until good weather, and the crop was in, and then you went and fought again. This was uh, around 24-7, 365 days a year for 14 years. So a lot of these farms fell into great disrepair, um, and uh, a lot of people, it actually some Bad things happened with the Senate. They exploited it, bought up a whole lot of land, and then they started to import refugees from war-torn places who came in and were willing to work for next to nothing. Not slaves, but for very low wages. So this influx of, um, of um, well, here are six outcomes that I've written down here. And uh, the first is that it altered the entire balance of power in the Mediterranean. So now Rome is in control of 80% of the Mediterranean. Uh, as I mentioned, the first true world war, the creation of a, of a professional standing army for the first time, the decline of the family farm, um, mobility and in migration. The turmoil of war meant that huge number of displaced Gauls, Iberians, Numidians, Greeks, Carthaginians, even Egyptians produced an oversupply of extremely cheap labor. And then what is Rome going to do with all that territory? What would you do? Build colonies. You try to pacify it, and you, um, you build colonies. And that's exactly what they did. So we will, in the remaining 10 minutes, we'll get through part of this. This is actually the headstone of a Roman surveyor. And what we're seeing here, this X that we see, is actually the plan view of a Roman surveying device called a groma. The, um, this vast territory, we've already talked about the Piacenza liver that uh, Romulus, according to legend, had brought Etruscans in to teach him all these kind of religious rituals and so forth. And then this map of the heavens. And in the founding of the town, you had to marry the affairs of the gods to the affairs of uh, human beings. So you married the sky, which was masculine, to the earth, which was feminine. And these are the, this is the map of the Roman heavens. It's divided into quadrants. Each quadrant is divided by four. There are 16 total. Um, this survives, oddly enough, on the architect's scale today in the United States. 16, eighth, quarter, half, whole. It's a Roman, it's the Roman system. This is actually from a surveying manual, fairly late, actually, in the Christian period, um, actually showing this, and then you'll notice on the bottom this DM, Decumanus, and the north KM, Cardo, Meridian. And then uh, to the right, if you're standing looking south, is the Occidens, the pars on my right, and the Oriens, the parts on my left. Orientation means face east. And then when this ceremony, which was called the contemplatio, contemplate with a template, but serious, to contemplate. Same word, meaning sort of the same thing, but the ceremony was called a contemplatio. A north-south line was struck, and an east-west line was struck, and the city would then be mapped, this map of the heavens, the templa would be brought down to the earth. Um, Haruspication, the augury, the, examining the flight of birds, the digging of the mundus, 
the burial of the sacrificed uh, animals' intestines and so forth. That's what we're seeing here. And the city is then inaugurated by hitching the plow, as Romulus supposedly did, and plowing out the boundary of the city to be occupied, to be occupied, uh, which was called the Pomerium. I've written this ceremony up. You can read it. It's about five pages long in the course folder. There we see the Groma. We see the north-south line being struck and the east-west line being struck, and that produced a particular pattern. And that p particular pattern was stamped out thousands of times across the entire Roman world, not just in the Mediterranean, but Rome eventually will expand. They're attacked by one of these leagues in Greece, they, they lose every battle, but they win the war. It's led by a guy named Pyrrhus. It's called a Pyrrhic victory. They ultimately, all of Greece comes in. Pergamum, actually, the king, actually willed his kingdom to Rome. Uh, they eventually, as you know, move into France. They move into Belgium. They move into Germany. They move into England. They move into all these places. Everywhere they went, they laid out this particular pattern. Even their military camps were laid out in this form, the red line being the pomerium or the boundary of the city, the sacred boundary that could not be crossed, the portals to, from Porta to carry the plow over the threshold, sacred to Janus, but it could be traversed, with the east-west street called a decumanus and a north-south street called a cardo, in which then at that intersection, which was called the decussus, you had then the forum and the Capitolium, the red building. The uh, Capitolium, of course, was a little model of, um, it had three gods in it, Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva, facing south, facing out into the forum, the space before uh, the temple. There we see Tim Gad on the lower right in um, North Africa. And here, now we can understand Poseidonia and its conversion into the Roman pastum as a reward for being loyal to Rome throughout the Second Punic War. Um, the Greek blue alignment of the buildings that we see here, the pink alignment is the alignment of the Roman city. The Ecclesia Sterion, the Agora, is abandoned. Roman institutions are inserted into it. They respected the Greek world greatly, and they retained a lot of their religious buildings and so on. Um, but basically, the whole city is re-inaugurated as a Roman city. And as a result, everybody in the city became a Roman citizen. There it is. There's that uh, juxtaposition of red, which is the Roman alignment, and blue, which is the Greek alignment. I mentioned a couple of times some of the cities. Uh, this is Jerusalem, just to, again, show you the Roman Cardo and Decumanus. Tim Gad, I've already mentioned, and what we will do um, very quickly here is go through part of Ostia, which is Rome's first colony, and we will con what we don't get through today, we will continue uh, on Monday. So we're looking here. Can you see it? Can you see the Roman colony embedded in that? The Pomerium right there. There is the Decumanus. There is the Cardo. Here is the Capitolium looking out into uh, the Forum. There's that high podium looking out into the forum. There's the Decumanus pa passing through. Same thing here as we see in Pompeii, where uh, number two is the Decumanus. Number 13 is the Cardo. It is entering then into the forum with number seven, which is the Capitolium, looking out, facing south. And then other public buildings, uh, let's name them, uh, because once that pattern was set, they could go anywhere clustered around the forum. No set place for them to go to. Um, so number nine at Pompeii is the Machellum, or the meat market. The circle in the middle was for selling fish. Um, across the forum on the other side, number five, difficult to read, was the um, Holatorium, or the vegetable market, and adjacent to that at number six were the public toilets with running water. Number three uh, was actually the Sanctuary of Apollo, Number four uh, was the system of weights and measures to make sure that no one was being cheated in the marketplace. Everybody, all the vendors had to show up early and get their weights checked to make sure that they were not cheating anybody. Number 15, number 14 are public buildings like the Curia, 
where the town council met. Number 11 is the sanctuary of the office of the Augustales. I've got a little bit in the course folder on the Augustales. They were a sort of civic group uh, comprised of freed slaves who um, had space on the forum and uh, who then could actually do, they did things like uh, repair the aqueducts. They were very interesting. Number 10, the sanctuary of the Lares. The Lares were the local gods, not the high gods in the Capitolium, but the local gods of the town. In the same way, every family had their own family gods. Um, you saw that in the movie Gladiator. How many of you have seen that movie? A few, half. Um, remember he had these little dolls? And he would set these dolls up in a little shrine, and he would light candles and say prayers. And then he would have a little bag of dirt from his home in Spain. Remember that? And he would rub that on his hands, and then he would say a prayer to his... Those were his ancestors and his ancestral gods. They, were, they did their homework in that movie. It was really quite good. Um, every town had one of these. This is the Lares, and um, it is not advancing for some reason. It is five till, so we will stop with this slide. And let me, before we do, let me take any questions that you might have. I've thrown a lot at you, but it's, um, it's very important to understand why um, I think or how the Roman city um, actually from this one template could produce a city like London, could produce a city like Barcelona, could produce a city like Jerusalem, all from that one template. What was that template? What were they? Streets, boundaries, both extramural and intramural, public buildings, monuments, memorial function. The streets carried what? Infrastructure, water supply, sewage, right? Public space. Four things. The constitutional frame. It was part of their religion, right? Okay. Any questions at all about anything? Yes? Yeah, they ran out of room. But that raises an interesting point. Aaron asked the question, why did they rotate it? Well, they ran out of room, apparently. Um, but because the, the, the city was born out of a ritual that was tied to ritual myth, myths of founding, uh, if you said the sooth right, you know, if you went through the ritual correctly, and the birds appeared, and the liver was good, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you named that south, that was south. You got me? You name it south, it's south. So as long as it was in the same quadrant, and as long as all the signs from the gods were adequate, were good, then that became south. Does that make sense? There's a line in Huckleberry Finn, one of my favorite novels of all time, where Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer are digging out under a fence. And Huck turns to Tom, and he says, Tom, hand me that spade. And Tom and Huck says, and Tom says, Huck, this ain't no spade. Uh, this is a claw hammer. Second time, Huck says, Tom, hand me that spade. Tom says, Huck, I told you, this ain't no spade, this is a claw hammer. Third time, Huck says, Tom, hand me the spade. And on the third time, he handed him the spade. You got me? He transformed by naming <laughs> a spade, a claw hammer into a spade. That's what it's used for. Uh, that's a very Roman way of thinking. Uh, extreme flexibility in terms of uh, rigid in certain ways and extreme flexibility in others. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? I'll see you on uh, Monday. Have a great weekend.